Um, it was a little difficult for me to think how to pitch what I'm going to talk about today, so I just thought I'd talk about some of the things that um, I don't know the answers to, so that you can tell me the answers to them. Uh, some of the things I'm interested in, some of the things, the initiatives that, that will play a fairly significant role in the Charles Perkins Centre. I'll just give you a little bit of background to the Charles Perkins Centre at the, at the university. It's the university's single biggest investment ever. Would you rather I used a microphone? You sure? Uh, single um, biggest investment ever, right. And, and it's on this link between um, diet, the food we eat, and, uh, and, and, and health. With, with a view to focusing on preventative health, not curing diseases caused by diet, but actually taking a step back and thinking, well, let's try and make these things not happen at all. Um, now, I, I started off um, 25 years ago when I moved from astronomy into life sciences. I got interested in soil because I was interested in structures. Richard said the last thing I did was look at clustering um, of galaxies to try and understand something about how the universe formed. And I got talking to this guy that was interested in soil, and of course soil's a highly clustered thing, and we were trying to un figure out if there was some connection between how soil clusters in space and how it evolves over time. So for a while I was a bit over-obsessed, some might say, with the, with the soil microbe plant system and how that works. But of course, and, and I told my kids, you know, when they said, what do you work on? I work, I work on soil, and they go, mm -hmm. I'd rather you were a fireman or something, you know. <laughs> uh, now I tell them I work on saving the planet and curing all sickness, <laughs> eradicating illness. Um, and, and soil plays an important role in that, but there's other stuff. And that's what I'll talk about. And uh, if I press this button, yeah, there we are. So, you quite often hear um, the debate about the environment and how it's protecting the environment is really important. Imagining, and, and, but, but largely politically, the environment is treated as a kind of a luxury. You know, if provided we can sort everything else out, like the economy and the rate of supply of iPads into the Apple shop and all that important stuff. Then we can worry about the environment afterwards. Um, now you guys probably know all this, but I think it's a, it is important to remember that we're actually part of the environmental system. We're just animals, right? We look rather sophisticated and some of us are better looking than, uh, than your average animal, but, um, but we are absolutely integral to the environment and it is in our interest as it is with every other organism on the planet that we maintain the environment. We've become so disconnected as the world's become increasingly urbanized, we've become so disconnected from from food, from the environment, from the things that we actually depend on. Most of us if we were dropped into you know, more than two hours from habitation without any sustenance, we'd be dead within a very short time, uh, such as our disconnect from the environment. And of course food is a major part of that. Food, food is, is, has, interestingly, has never really been taken seriously as part of uh, a preventative health program in the West, in Western cultures. Food is something you take to stop you getting hungry. Um, and kind of one of the things I'd like to try to do with the research that I'm doing with, with colleagues at, at the universities is, is reposition agriculture back into this role, not just of supporting societal health and preventing illness. <coughs> so many of our diseases are, are caused by our diet, which is bizarre given that food is supposed to, to sustain us. But also address the fact that the food that we uh, produce is being produced in a manner which is demonstrably unsustainable and is causing significant 
destruction of the ecosystem services on which our food depends, never mind the natural environment of which, by the way, we're part of, because it provides us with a lot of things that, that, that we need as well as uh, maintaining the pool of biodiversity on the planet. So this is the picture that I'm kind of going to talk about. What, what is it um, about the journey of nutrition from the environment through plants and animals and into our kitchens and then into us that uh, what are the factors that, that affect that and, and what's wrong with the system and how might it be put right? I like this diagram. It's the there are, so, so I've, if you've ever read, if you've never read the World Economic Forum Risk Report, um, it's pr produced every year after the summit in um, in Switzerland. Damn it, I've just forgotten the name of the the Davos. big was it Davos. Yes, 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 Davos. Um, and it summarises the state of the world through the eyes of something like three or four hundred of leading economists and business people. So these are not your kind of left-wing alarmist, kind of trendy, greeny people. These are hard-nosed business people that are worried about the future of society from the perspective of, um, of the economy. So every year they come up with the top 50 risks and they have nice imaginative ways of presenting those risks every year. Um, this is 2000 and who didn't switch the phone off? If, a if it happens in my class, I get the phone and phone their mum. <laughs> and give them a row and tell on them. Uh, so this is the risk report from 2011. And along the bottom is uh, probability, and on the vertical axis is impact. And because they're economists, they measure impact in billions of dollars. Now, what you can immediately see in this diagram is the risks that you don't need to read the risks, but you just need to know that they're mostly at the top right hand side, which means they're both very likely and having a high impact. Right? Of course, that's because they've selected the 50 most important ones. But nevertheless, it's very interesting to see what's up there. And I'll come to that in a minute. But what's much more interesting and kind of negates the whole practice of trying to imagine even drawing a picture like this is figure number two, which is the same, uh, the same risks, but this time drawn on a diagram that illustrates the, the interconnections between those risks. So the next 10 years, the, these are meant to be the risks that we face over the next 10 years, very small window, and they're highly interconnected. Now, when you've got a risk network like this, if any one of those risks is realized, it changes the whole risk landscape because, of course, it's connected to all these other risks, and so the probabilities of these other risks change. And when you've got a system that's so highly connected, and we're only talking about a forecast over the next 10 years, you know, can we really calculate, can we really predict the problems and the issues that we may need to address in the next 10 years? I'd say absolutely not. But what we can do is identify clusters of risk where th there are particular issues that we should probably be paying attention to. And in, in the 2011 uh, risk report, there are three major risk nexus, the plural of nexus is nexus, I had to look it up, not nexuses. Uh, and those three major risks are, the two on the left hand side there, focus on um, economic aspects. And we all think, ah, that's okay, we can live without money, right, because you can't eat money, I keep telling my kids. And that's true, but actually you can't quite ignore money for other reasons. And then the one on the right-hand side is what I call the 
sustainable food nexus and what they call the water food energy nexus. This is the cluster of risks around water security, climate change, food security, energy, price volatility, and then linked to food security are um, chronic and infectious disease because as, as uh, you become less nourished, you become more or less adequately nourished. That can be because you're obese or because you, are, you don't have enough nourishment, you become much more susceptible to all kinds of diseases. Now, the, especially the 2012 risk report paints a really quite uh, depressing picture of what the next 10 years are going to look like. And of course, the, the big argument against, and, and I get this all the time, that when people talk about, oh, it's stuff's going to happen, we need to do something about that, we need you know, more investment and stuff to, to deal with these issues. They always say, oh, and people have been saying that forever, and we always find a way of innovating out of, you know, whenever something gets scarce or, or there's a, a real incentive to, to find a solution, the economy sorts it out. Um, and Malthus made the, I don't know if you've heard of Thomas Malthus, made, made a very famous prediction about the end of the world when he predicted that um, population was growing exponentially, food production was growing linearly, there was going to be a crossover point where there wouldn't be enough food for everyone and there'd be a giant world war. It was a couple of hundred years early, but of course it never transpired. And everyone said, oh, you know, Malthus said that and it never happened because we innovated a way out. Now the unfortunate from, from Malthus's point of view was that he made that prediction on the edge of the Industrial Revolution. So, based on an, on an organically driven economy, he was absolutely correct. What happened was there was an amazing technological shift, and the Industrial Revolution happened, and agricultural production didn't go up linearly. It also went up exponentially, and here we all are, all seven billion of us, and counting. However, those gains, as we now know, were one at the expense of borrowing from the future. The, econ the global economy can be thought of as, as running on three liquids. First of all, the organic economy before the Industrial Revolution ran on water, and cheap energy from coal took over, and, and oil. So liquid water, liquid oil powered the Industrial Revolution. A tonne of coal does the work of one person for 30 years. Amazing. And then the third liquid, which has been running the economy for the last 50 years. Does anybody know what that is? Liquid credit. We've been borrowing from the future since the Industrial Revolution. And it's coming back to bite us on the bum now. If we think of just one of those... Um, risks in that right-hand energy, water, food risk nexus. This is energy, and it relates to this point about our ability to innovate out of the problems that we face. This is a very nice piece of work by Robert Ayers, calculating economic growth, or, or in this case American GDP, based purely on available energy. So the red line there represents actual GDP and the blue dotted line represents GDP calculated purely on the basis of available energy. And the uh, predictions, aside from a slight decoupling towards the end due to what was a, a bubble of, of, of credit, the there's a very strong relationship between energy and the capacity for the economy to continue to grow and innovate. Now, the era of cheap energy has gone, at least in the short term, a very recent paper just out a few months, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, in the IMF calculating the likely rise in energy prices over the next 10 years, including 
in their uh, errors depending on different uh, assumptions you make about the availability of different forms of the, actually the availability and the extractability of oil because it, it's one thing to say that whether oil has peaked in terms of the amount that's in the in the ground but another thing when you start uh, including the fact that the oil is becoming increasingly expensive to get out of the ground so they it cost forty dollars to get um, oil out of Saudi Arabia per barrel in '95, I think it was. It now costs ninety dollars. Actually, no, I think it was 2005. It was forty dollars. It now costs ninety dollars to get out the ground. All the easy oil has been already acquired, and because of that, the 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 kind of middle projection there is a doubling in oil prices over the next 10 years which is good which means that the era of cheap energy is gone which means that will have a huge impact on the capacity of economies to work our way out of some of these problems that we face the second thing is because of the third um, liquid that powered our economy from 1950 onwards more or less was, was liquid credit. We've got a lot of paying back to do. And this is a plot, again from the IMF, of the ratio of debt to GDP, government debt to GDP in the G20 advanced economies, advanced economies, right? Now, there we are. Uh, we are kind of here, round about 100% at the moment. Economists, I understand, are comfortable with 70 or 80 percent. They get very nervous when the debt reaches 100 percent. And the cost of borrowing, as seen in some European countries, then becomes larger than the increase in, in national uh, um, domestic product, and the debt can't be serviced. This is the projected level of debt to 2050 in the G20 countries, assuming the social contract that nations have with their citizens, which includes affordable health care and um, some kind of pension. Uh, and it's 300 to 350 percent. In other words, it ain't ever, ever, ever going to happen. Uh, debt isn't going to rise much higher than it is just now. It simply cannot, which means that things like affordable health care and um, affordable old age are probably things of the past. And it also indicates, again, the stress that's on the economy in terms of our ability to innovate out of the problems we face, right? That's just a bit of a grounding on, on the reality of the situation. Everything's connected. There's a serious issue. Uh, associated with availability of food, cheap energy, water, uh, and health. And food plays such an important role in that nexus that now it's generally regarded that the availability of food and water um, moving into the next 10, 20 years is going to be the number one most significant factor affecting global well-being. That's partly because of rising population, but it's also due, like, you know, like everything that's, that's, that's kind of where there's a bunch of different things interacting. There's a bunch of factors. There's levels of consumption are increasing per head. People's diets are changing. Population is certainly increasing. Uh, commodities are being traded on the market, all sorts of stuff. And um, in the developed countries, at least, our population is aging. And the, the, all of that combines to, uh, uh, plus of course the economy, combines <coughs> to make things quite difficult. So looking then forward to, um, to the state of the food system as it is now and then what we might do about improving the system, because I actually think all of these problems are solvable. Um, we just need to, well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what we need to do, I think. This is a, a, a diagram of all the factors that affect, remember that picture I showed at the beginning with this 
smug looking woman sitting on top of a pile of stuff and looking healthy and thin. Um, so the factors that affect the flow of nutrition from the environment through plants, animals and into people and keep us all healthy was studied in, uh, in a, a, I think a really, if you're interested in this whole thing about food and health and stuff, read the UK Foresight Obesity Report 2007. It's a fantastic four years body of work trying to figure out all the factors that influence the flow of nutrition through society. Um, with a focus on obesity, but actually it's a focus on any kind of um, non-communicable disease, most of which are diet related. The original intention was to come up with a magic model that you could just um, press a button and get the answer. Uh, that didn't work for reasons that you'll see. But it included things like um, social psychology, the production, uh, food production, the, the capacity of the environment to support the production of healthy food, uh, food consumption. Down here, we've got physiology. Up here, we've got individual psychology. All the stuff that goes on in your head when you walk past the chocolate counter in the supermarket that says, oh, if you eat it quickly, it won't matter. And then um, physical activity environment uh, and the individual physical activity. The fact that you see all these people jogging and think, just make fun of them because they don't look happy, do they? And then in here is the kind of metabolic engine that uh, determines the, the, uh, the consequences of what you eat in terms of how much is stored, how much is used. Interesting fact, and I didn't know this until two weeks ago, you, the average uh, person needs about 2,500 calories a day. Did you know, and I think this is true, that you use 1,500 calories when you're asleep? The best thing you can do to lose weight is get a good night's sleep. That's my kind of diet. All the stuff, that all the repair, cell regeneration stuff goes on at night in your brain and all these memories, they take energy to get cemented in. And most of that, um, so, I heard, so a friend of mine who used to play for the Wallabies tells me that during his fitness campaign, he used to get up at four in the morning to eat cheese. <laughs> To lose weight and build muscle, because otherwise the body starts to run out of energy during the night and you don't uh, repair yourself as well. So once you fill in all these bubbles with all the factors that people could dream up in a four year study of, of all the things that affect uh, nutrition flow from the environment through society, there's a hell of a lot of stuff. You can't read that and you're not meant to read it. All you meant to think is, oh my God, you know, no wonder obesity is the most serious global epidemic um, and continuing to rise in most developed countries. And, and, and its rate of rise in developing nations is also scary. And then at the centre of all of that is the individual, as I said, the individual metabolic. This is uh, the energy balance, the, all the stuff that goes on in your body to, to, uh, to, to, to take that energy, partition it, and the, the, uh, the nutrition that's required to keep all the organs inside you functioning. Um, now, the point I want to make about all of this is that the link between you and global change is a huge spider of networks. I think somebody, I can't remember who it was, everything touches everything. Completely true that, you know, we tend to think that we, well, I'll come to that later. So in, it's all about networks. It's all rather complicated. Everything <laughs> seems to affect everything else. Um, now, there are two choices when you're faced with these kind of problems. One is just to close your eyes and just work on a wee bit of it. Uh, the other, thinking that if you solve all the wee bits and then join them back together again, you'll somehow solve the big thing. Uh, we now know that that's completely wrong. Uh, it, it worked for certain, you know, for 
since the scientific renaissance until about the 1950s, it worked reasonably well um, for certain kinds of problems. But the world has become such a connected place, and as we understand more about the life sciences and, and biology from the perspective that used to be applied to physical objects, we're, we're understanding that the huge connectedness, the fact that every cell depends on its function of every cell depends on its context in an organ which depends on its context in an organism which depends on its context in an ecosystem which depends on its global context. There are, there are a huge number of interactions and we somehow have to try and deal with that level of complexity. The consequences of the fact that everything's connected is, and I probably don't need to tell you guys this, this is linear thinking, right, which I do all the time, right? Um, so you tend to think if something happens, something had to cause it. And you need to find that thing that caused it and then do something about this arrow in between and you'll solve the problem, right? However, most systems aren't like that. And if you just think of the simplest instance where A causes B but B feeds back on A, then what causes what? And, and it, it no longer makes sense. Okay, if, if B changes in a way you don't like, well, that's not necessarily because of A. It could be because of the way that B inter interacts with A and, and, and that, how that affects B. So you can no longer think in terms of simple causal chains, and you have to start thinking about networks of cause. And the interesting thing about that is that once you get above two or three interacting things, your brain melts. And if you're a guy, it's about one, right? You, lots of cognitive science on this that, that, that has demonstrated since the 50s that, broadly speaking, you can hold about three things in your head at once and use intuition to solve those kind of problems. Once there are more than three chunks interacting, intuition is no longer a guide. And this is important because these kinds of systems behave in ways that are, again, counter to our, our intuition, but not counter to our experience in a funny kind of way. This is, a, again, a recent paper in Nature making the point that the level at which food production is now perturbing the global ecological state may be close to a tipping point. Uh, in other words, the magnitude of forcing may be as close to the previous period of glaciation. And what I mean by that is down here we've got the 1700s and that little green piece, in the dark green piece in the pie is how much of the surface of the earth was actually cultivated or used for agriculture. And then since the Industrial Revolution as populations have exploded and probably more importantly our consumption has exploded <coughs> the fraction of the planet's surface that is used for agriculture and is managed and when you manage the surface of you know when you manage a piece of land you're not just capturing photosynthetic radiation you're, you're changing the hydrological cycle you're changing everything you're changing nutrient partitioning you're changing the, uh, the soil uh, properties, the, the properties of the soil and the microbial community, and, and everything that sustains um, the ecosystem is being, is being changed. And there's a suspicion, and they were hypothesizing, that we may not be far from so-called tipping point where the, once the level of biological forcing uh, or ecological forcing goes beyond a certain point, the system switches to a dramatically different ecological state. And that's what can happen when you've got these highly connected complex kind of systems. Now the other thing that's interesting is that depending on how systems are connected um, very much determines the relative importance of different parts of that system. <coughs> So here's an example of a random network. So there's some nodes, and these nodes are connected a little bit like the risk uh, landscape that we saw earlier. Uh, and, and if you um, 
if some of these nodes are broken, or some of the links are broken, or some of the nodes fail, then even for a relatively small proportion of node failure, the network breaks up and is quite will behave in quite a dramatically different way. Now, one way to think about this is that we saw that diagram earlier about all the factors that influence the flow of nutrition through the, the environment into people. We will never know everything about that interaction network. You can never make all the measurements. You can never characterize all the interactions. You probably can't even imagine all the interactions. So given that level of complexity, how important is our ignorance? Well, it turns out that if, if we're ignorant about some of these nodes and we don't include them, it makes a big difference to the network if the network is a random thing. Now, there's a class of networks called scale-free networks, which um, don't really want to go into a lot of detail about what those are, other than um, a few nodes, uh, in a random network, every node is connected roughly the same amount of time, by the same number of links to every other node. In a scale-free network, there are some nodes that are very highly connected, and some nodes, most nodes that are not very highly connected. You've got distribution of connectivity. And it turns out that these kind of scale-free networks are very common, appear to be very common at least, in all sorts of natural systems like food webs, like cell networks in your body, uh, like social networks, like the internet. All kinds of robust systems seem to have this kind of scale-free behavior. Now, the interesting thing about scale-free behavior is that when you, if you're ignorant about nodes or links, it doesn't actually affect if you're randomly ignorant, that is, it doesn't actually affect um, the network much. However, if you're not randomly network, uh, sorry, not randomly ignorant, but you're ignorant about some of these hubs which are highly connected, then it very much affects the behaviour. And I'll explain what that means in, in the context of, of trying to understand these networks in a minute. <coughs> So the consequences of all of this is that um, connected risks, the fact that the risk landscape is so complex and connected means that the future is hugely uncertain. So trying to predict what's going to happen and then trying to stop it, there are two problems with that. One is our chances of predicting what's really going to be a problem in the next 10 or 20 years is highly limited. Secondly, figuring out how to stop it, you're working with these kind of causal networks, so rather than a simple cause-effect thing, it might well, very well be difficult to figure out how to change and stop it happening. And in things like climate change, we're probably locked into a fairly serious alteration in the future climate anyway already, no matter what we do. Therefore, the future really is about adaptation. We need to create solutions that are robust to all of that uncertainty. So the fact that we're uncertain about some of these factors actually turns out to be exactly um, something we can use to try and find these kind of, of solutions. Um, because the robust solutions are the ones that are forgiving of our ignorance. And I'll, I'll explain that with an example. And that's provided we're not ignorant about the solution. So, so sorry, ignorant about the hub. So if you, this, that scale-free network example, uh, those networks are very robust to failure. And that means they're very robust to our ignorance, unless we are ignorant about some of the hubs. So it's telling us that we don't necessarily need to know lots of detail about the network, but we need to know about parts of it in rather more detail than other parts. Therefore. The question then in trying to find these kind of uh, robust solutions to these challenges that we face is that we need to identify the hubs. So in that network of factors that affect the flow of nutrition through society, what are the really key interactions in there? Is it all marketing? Is it all to do with, with uh, peer pressure? Is it to do with our basal metabolism, all that kind of stuff. What's the real 
what are the real parts of that network that we really need to understand? So the question is then, how do we move from, from where we are to some kind of adaptive state? And the reason that I'm suggesting the state we're in now is not adaptive is because all the trajectories are look like they're going in the wrong way. Availability of water, availability of food, degradation of the environment, climate change, energy prices, all of that stuff looks like it's heading in a direction where there isn't an obvious um, consistency. So here's an example of this kind of network thinking in practice. And this is some work that we did a few years ago trying to look at the cell cycle and what the cell cycle is basically the process by which cells divide and maintain themselves. So the, the anybody who cleans their house knows that your skin sheds cells and they get replaced by new cells. Uh, they do that at various rates in your body. High rate of replacement in your gut, in your lungs, skin. Um, and that's where you get cancer. Because every time a cell divides, there's an opportunity for error. Um, but the cell has an amazing network of processes that correct those errors and either correct them and the cell goes on to function adequately, or if it can no longer function, then there's a programmed cell death and that, 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 that cell that's got the error in it is, is killed, right? Through apoptosis. Great, really robust system uh, of checkpoints in place to prevent these kind of errors. Given how many millions and millions and millions of cell divisions there are in your body, it's remarkable that it works uh, so well. And it's all because of this network. It's an incredibly robust network. It, there are a bunch of external... So if, imagine if you're a cell. There are a bunch of things external to the cell which matter. Um, signaling, growth factors, hormones, things that are in the, uh, uh, the bloodstream uh, that affect the, what the cell is going to do. And then there's... Uh, if, you, if you're a diseased cell and you're, you're taking some, some uh, medicine, there are uh, drug um, inputs and things that, that can also affect uh, the, the state of the cell. Uh, also DNA damage if you're trying to kill off cells using chemo um, radiotherapy. Then in here we've got a bunch of kind of signaling processes. We've got the genetic uh, code here and then the transcription of those genes and then down here we've got um, metabolic processes that control growth and division and you end up with something that's really quite horrible and complicated and in fact when we started this work everybody said forget it it's going to be too complicated you're never going to know all the details of all these interactions because we simply can't measure them and anyway, they're different for everybody. And that's absolutely true. Except that if nature was really finely tuned, like a TV set, you know, if you pull a wee bit of a TV set out, the whole TV stops working. If nature was really like that, I don't think that things like evolution and, and uh, well, we simply couldn't function, right? Because cells are all the time perturbed by factors external, and, and they, they do remain, they, they do, um, maintain this incredible robustness. Most cancer models, most computational models of cancer are rather simple. They involve maybe half a dozen proteins because most labs around the world, most cancer labs around the world, focus on a few pathways. It's this old how much can you hold in your head thing. Two or three interacting pathways and the, everyone has a favourite gene and everyone has a favourite drug target and that's how cancer research more or less progressed around the world until fairly recently. So what we were trying to do was, was draw that knowledge together. Because what we noticed was that these simple models, the ones that didn't have the complexity, were exquisitely sensitive to the details. So you did have to measure all these protein interaction kinetics and all the pharmacokinetics and everything had to be measured very accurately to, in order to tune the model to work in a particular way. But what we found out was that as we added more and more complexity into the, into the model, the behavior suddenly just locked in. So the system then became very robust 
And we, as we added more and more complexity, we could change parameter values by two or three orders of magnitude, 100 or 1,000 times, and still see roughly the same behavior in the cell, which is intuitively more appealing uh, to us than, uh, than having something that needed to be so finely tuned. The beauty of that is that then you don't need to know the detail because it doesn't matter by a factor of a thousand uh, how those interactions work. What matters is that you've included them in the description so you have some level of complexity and feedback and then that makes everything rather insensitive to any underlying uncertainties. So, for example, we could, uh, uh, as we did, um, look at a particular case, or in this case a particular patient, and look at some of the key proteins and how these are changing during the cell cycle in that individual. In this case, it's a particular form of, of breast cancer. And then use the model to back calculate a multiple intervention strategy that would turn the um, diseased cell into a non-proliferative state, uh, in other words, a, a, a cancer cell which was uh, which was not you you would you would arrest the the growth of the of the tumor. So you can predict the uh, the intervention strategy that will return a relatively um, benign cancer cell, and then you can use that cocktail to treat a model of a healthy cell and look for toxicity effects, which then allows you to go through a process of deciding whether a particular intervention is viable or not for a particular patient. Now this is very far from being um, applied in practice, but the point that I want to make by talking about this is that first of all it's possible to incorporate the complexity and it actually gets easier when you incorporate the complexity. Secondly, this AFXB problem that there isn't just one factor, that you, in other words there isn't just a single intervention, but you can use these kinds of approaches to identify multiple interventions. Now when you're dealing with multiple interventions, doing it by trial and error it's just combinatorically impossible. There are too many different things that you have to vary to, to look for some optimum. But together with some of these kind of modeling approaches, it is possible to, to narrow down the range of potential choices and throw up some opportunities and hypotheses about how you might intervene to change a particular state. And then you can study the effect of that intervention and make sure that the intervention doesn't actually make the system worse. In other words, in this case, it doesn't kill all the other cells as well. So how does that relate back to the problem that we started talking about? And that's the whole food system thing. Well, we've been started working with this gentleman, Scott Heckbert, who's at the University of Alberta. One of the few people in the world pioneering a new area of science called computational social science trying to understand how societal behavior affects um, the stability and, for that matter, sustainability of, of society. Now, he did a very interesting uh, study of the collapse of the Mayans. Now, the Mayans are a great... If you've ever read any of uh, Jared Diamond's books, it's a great account of what happened to the Mayans. They were, at the time, one of the most sophisticated races, um, civilizations on the planet. They had amazing mathematics. They were able to predict eclipses, do magical things with the mathematics. They had great buildings. They had a really um, sophisticated trade network. This is just a, a map of the Mayan society in, in, at its prime. And each dot here is a village or a city. And the links there represent trade between these uh, these towns and, and villages and cities. These are trade links. Um, and then it all came to a disaster. The population increased as they, as they became more and more prosperous. Their agriculture expanded. But a whole bunch of stuff turns up on the archaeological record. 
that shows that as population rapidly increased, it reached a certain point where suddenly the whole system just collapsed. And the population crashed by 90%. And we're talking millions and millions of people living in the area at the time. Uh, and some of that was due to death, some of it was due to, due to disease, and some of it due to migration. The point was that the system, which is the agriculture social trade system, reached a tipping point. So the level of environmental degradation, um, or the hypothesis is that the level of environmental degradation reached to, uh, a level where it became difficult, not impossible, but difficult to support and feed everybody in the, in the peninsula here, which led to a whole bunch of things like social unrest, disease and things which coincided with a drought to bring the system down in a very, very short space of time. So what Scott set out to do was see if he could replicate that um, in, a, in a model. And I won't go into the details of the model, but there's a, there's a whole bunch of factors here, in, including population. Uh, sorry, that's crop production. Where's population? There's degradation. Uh, productivity, you can see climate cycles here. Um, and, 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 oh yeah, population's up there. Now, the next slide, if it works, shows that model in action. And it shows the population growing quite happily up to a few hiccups. Coinciding with certain climate events. And then a catastrophic collapse. Because the system lost its robustness. So although there were drought periods of drought, the population dropped a little bit, but it recovered until it reached this point where the environmental degradation was so high that the system lost its robustness. And there's a bunch of other things in there too. The, the, the fact that as those links, those trade links broke down, then the, the, the re resilience of individual cities and towns was, was reduced as well. And so there's a whole bunch of factors. The point is it's not a single factor, a whole bunch of factors. So here's a the beginnings of some kind of approach. Now, what we're trying to do with this now is, is tie in the, uh, try and understand if we can model the uh, environmental degradation uh, and nutritional aspects. So, in other words, understanding agriculture from the point of view of its role in, in supporting uh, environmental health and, and human health and see if we can develop some kind of approach that begins to model the complexity of, that I showed earlier on the of, of obesity network, where we can begin to understand those factors and try and identify the hubs and the areas where we need more information and begin to understand what stabilizes that system into something that's a little bit more sustainable. So, just to finish, when we think about food, we have to think about food in terms of how it's connected to all of the other, many of the other factors that affect and, and impinge on the well-being of society, of which there are a number in, um, rearing their head in the next 10 or 20 years. The future is uncertain, uh, but what's certainly the case, the level of connectivity, is such that we're going to need multiple interventions in order to adapt to whatever, to move the system into a more adaptive state. There are scales ranging from individual to global that we need to think about, but those complexities need not be overwhelming, and in fact, those complexities may be an essential simplifying feature that allow us to find the solutions. And by ignoring them, thinking it's too difficult, we're probably making a huge mistake. Now that raises a whole bunch of issues about how policies are derived, because I'm working with the government just now on food, water and, and, uh, and land security in Australia. And of course, we're talking to five different ministers. Now, who owns the agenda when you've got such a connected risk landscape? Who owns that space? And who's thinking about policy? I mean, I showed them that diagram and they just they went interested. It was too difficult. Um, and so this is the key thing. 
in order to make progress, we do have to understand the interactions between societies, economics, and the life and physical sciences. And that's a major challenge, but there are people here that do that every day, I'm sure. I just want to finish with a quote from World Economic Forum Risk Report 2012. This is um, Klaus Schwab. He's the chairman and founder of the World Economic Forum. So underlying all of the global risk we face in the next 10 years are velocity, multiplicity, and interconnectivity, creating a global system where mastering complexities will be the foremost challenge. And I think that's what I've tried to articulate in the last 40 minutes or so. Thanks very much.